Good morning and a warm welcome to Edsel Parish Church Service of Worship on Sunday the 25th of February 2024. Let us come before God in prayer. Let us bow our heads. O Lord, our God, we gather before you, the King of mercy and of grace. You reign omnipotent in every place, and we pray that we may be all conscious of your presence and your power with us in this sanctuary of praise. We acknowledge you to be our Redeemer and Saviour in whom we trust. You are our rock and our refuge, <clears throat> our strength, our sustenance, and our support. Help us worship you in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Enable us to humbly glorify your high and holy name. Minister to each as each has need, and reveal your will through the ministry of your word to us. Receive from us our sacrifice of praise and our free will offerings. Take them and use us for the good and for the growth of, you, of Christ's kingdom of love, here, near, and far. Increase our faith and bless our fellowship with you and one another in holy communion. Be with all who contribute to Edsel Parish Church in terms of their time, talents, and treasures. Be with those who cannot be with us in person here today, and bless all those who follow our services from various locations in Scotland, the United Kingdom, and elsewhere in the world. We acknowledge that we are one people in Christ, and so unite us by the Holy Spirit. 
Bless the various ministries in the church, throughout the church regionally, nationally, and internationally. We are mindful of the words of the psalmist, who wrote, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Be with us always to bless and to build your house. Father, forgive us our sins for Jesus' sake. Wash us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We recognize that sin is not only detrimental to our harmony, to our health, to our wholeness, but it's a barrier to our friendship and fellowship with you, our God, and one another. As the prophet Isaiah once said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear dull, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. Lord, have mercy in Jesus' name. Draw near to us and supply our every need. Provide, protect, and prosper all. We pray and long for peace in a world of hatred and hostilities. Comfort and console the bereaved. Shelter those that are vulnerable. Support the weary. Seek out the lost. Revive your cause in the powerful and precious name of Jesus, who taught us to say together, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Do we recognize this place? Yes, St Kilda. Did it not come up in a, a quiz night we had last year or, or thereabouts? Yeah. Um, <coughs> It's a, it's a wonderful, it's just a wonderful place. I used to, on a clear day, so that was probably, I think that was maybe the third Sunday in August in the Western Isles, and you could see from the door of the Scarista Church of Scotland, you could look over out to sea, and about 50 miles off the coast was the little island of St. Kilda. And I had a number of folks in my congregation over in Stornoway who had, who had, one lady had kayaked from Harris all the way to St Kilda and they were followed with the Alba film crew and there was another chap in the congregation who's a well-known Gaelic writer who had made a documentary for Alba some years back on the subject of St Kilda and I knew numerous folk in Sky and in Harris and in um, Lewis who had visited. And of course, I encountered people who had associations with, there was an old boy or man that I am, um, whose funeral actually, he made a profession of faith while he was in his mid-90s. And uh, I remember him telling me that he originally came from a place called Shawbost on the west coast of Lewis. And he remembers as a boy, the last minister from St. Kilda had settled in their little township. It's a remarkable place. And I remember reading the, about the John MacDonald, the Apostle of the North, and how in the 1840s, he would go over in a little boat to take the gospel and to preach and to minister and to baptize and to give communion uh, and so on. It's, it's a remarkable place, remarkable story. And I don't know if you'll recall a few years ago, I wrote a wee song in them. And it got me thinking about today's theme. I was thinking, how am I going to introduce our theme today, which is repentance and faith? And I want to read the words of that song <clears throat> and explain how it is a fitting metaphor for our theme. The chorus goes like this. 29th of August, 1930, the folks of St. Kilda did cross the sea Forsaking the islands where born and bred, generations lived, now left to the dead. 
sailing away from St. Kildon home, sad farewells, wayfarers roam, leaving the crags to storm-tossed swell, forefathers rest forever to dwell. Gutted remains, empty to last, stony witness to what is now past, church abandoned, school as they left, echoes remain forlorn and bereft. The last 36 to Morvern were bound, on harebell waving, weeping did sound, mourning their loss but looking ahead, hope of new life on mainland instead. No room for dogs drowned in the bay, livestock was sold to help pay their way. St. Kildan's story of 4,000 years ended for good on a blue sea of tears. And that's a picture to us. You can imagine the hardships. If you've ever read about St. Kilda, it was a hard life. Infant mortality was just through the, you know, it was, they lost so many of their young people. And before all the, the, the new technologies and all the new developments, it was a somewhat perilous existence for many. And you can imagine not only the hardships, but the heartaches of leaving your ancestral home, the place where your fathers and mothers and grandparents and their parents and grandparents and so on, down through the generations, rested. And yet, there is also that hope. They were looking to, they were leaving behind, but they were looking to a better and a brighter future. And that is the picture of repentance and faith that is our theme for today. It's a U-turn, it's a turning away from and a turning to. That's what Lent commemorates. It's a, a humbling oneself before God. It's confessing one's need of him, recognition of sin, of, of wrongdoing, and a seeking to be in a right relationship with God and one another, one that is rooted and built up in love. And hence, it's a turning from, but it's a turning to in faith and hope. It's a journey, just like the folks. And sometimes it's hard to leave the old way of life. But the Christian life, Christ holds out to us a glorious, a much more glorious, better inheritance, a much brighter future. And that is the journey that we are on as Christians. It's a leaving one life behind and it's pursuing another until we reach our destination, that safe and calm place. We're going to, we're going to sing a beautifully mournful psalm, like they do still in the Highlands and in, the, in some of our sister denominations. Um, when, I, when I came back to the Lowlands, one of the things that I was, um, I struggled with initially was to catch the pace of the tempo of the songs, the hymns that we sang, because we used to sing quite slowly with the Psalms in the, in the Highlands and Islands. And um, when it came here in the organ, you were trying to get your breath to get them in the run of the next line sort of thing. And folks would say if they encountered anything slow, anything solemn, they would say, it's a dirge. It's got to be, you know, jaunty and happy. But reality is not always like that. And you see, the Bible has a song in it, the Psalms in particular, but their hymnals the same for every mood and occasion. And there is a time sometimes we're going to be singing this hymn 
this uh, tune, psalm tune, is called St. Kilda. And to me, it just encapsulates and captures the mood of this hymn so perfectly. It's the theme of repentance. It's that turning from, it's confessing one's sin and turning to God. It's the prodigal son coming to his senses and returning and finding the father is on his way to meet him in his embrace. It's a wee bit like, you know, um, we don't always listen to, to popular uh, music and jaunty songs on the radio and so on to make us happy. Me, I listen to slower whiskey blues and everything, right? Cowboy songs. Somebody's nicked my horse and my wife's went off with a milkman and that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, they're not all jolly. But this one, it's a recognition of need in order for the transformation to take place. So it you, you have, do you, have we sung this before? The, to the tune St. Kilda. Da, 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 da. You recognize it? Some do, some don't. You'll catch up because I think there's about five stanzas or so. So if you don't get the first one, you're going to have it by the second. It's really straightforward. Come and meet her. Um, so Psalm 51. And it's, there's no music. It's just the singing like in the old days. So this, was, this would have been Edsel 150 years ago, let's say. Okay. things about these slow hymns and psalms is you can actually reflect on the words as you're singing them. That's the goal. That's the idea anyway behind it. 
David's going to read to us from the New Testament scriptures. And today's reading is from the Gospel of Mark, um, chapter 1, verses 1 to 20. John the Baptist prepares the way. In the, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Here endeth the reading. Thanks be to God. Thank you. We shall sing once again this time. I think this is a well-known hymn. It's number 533 in the church hymnal. Will you come and follow me? Say. 
please turn back with me to the portion of Scripture that, we, that David read to us a few moments ago. We are in the Gospel according to Mark in chapter 1, and I want to read once again in order for us to reflect for a short time upon verses 14 and 15, these words. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the Gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. Last Sunday was Communion Sunday and our theme was the word made flesh. In the weeks leading up to that, we addressed the significance of Jesus' baptism and then his preparation for public ministry via his temptation in the wilderness where he triumphed over the evil one. Today we turn to his inaugural address or message, the outset in other words, his first words at the outset of his public ministry. And that message is the same one that the prophets proclaimed before him and the apostles preached after his resurrection and ascension. It's the same fundamental message that the church must continue to proclaim until his return. And hence our theme today is repent and believe in the gospel. This is an appropriate topic for the season of Lent, which is a season of preparation, a season of penitential acts, you might say, proceeding in the build-up to Christ's cross and his crown. Therefore, let us all recognize God the Redeemer. Now, after John was arrested, we read, Jesus came into Galilee. Jesus began his public ministry after John the Baptist was imprisoned incarcerated for proclaiming good news, forbidding the people repent, to come and be baptized in readiness, to be washed, to be cleansed, in readiness for the coming of Messiah. Jesus, we note, was undeterred by the opposition and persecution by the religious authorities of John. John, you'll recall, was the, the forerunner, the herald of God's Messiah. He was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And he specifically was the one who baptized Jesus in the Jordan and proclaimed to all, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then there was the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which like a dove came down upon Jesus. He was appointed and anointed God's Christ for his mission, which he must accomplish. And hence he's not put off by the threats, by the intimidation, but the opposition of the world. Jesus initiated his public ministry in Galilee, where he was raised. And maybe there's an important lesson for us in that. He began in the place where he was familiar with its, with its people, with its layout, with the places. And maybe God is teaching us that we that our mission begins at home, often in the past and maybe even today, but I think less so because the church has stressed the importance of mission, home mission. But often when we thought of mission in the past, we tended to think of missionaries who were annoying, but appointed and sent overseas to a far off country. But our task is to share the good news, the glad tidings of good news to all, beginning at home, in our own homes, in our communities, 
and so on. Just like Jesus did. Jesus makes here his inaugural address. And it's a very simple message. Repent and believe in the gospel. Turn. Turn to God. Believe the good news. Live it out in love. Let all hear and heed God's revelation. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Jesus preached the word of God. The word of Scripture was ever on his lips because it was in his heart. That's why I chose a psalm earlier on to introduce our theme. Because in the Scriptures, more than any other portion of Scripture, of the Bible, it's the Psalms that Jesus speaks. These are the songs that he sang and he prayed. They are his word after all. But all Scripture was breathed out. And here is the living word. And you see, the primary purpose of that word in Scripture is to reveal the word incarnate, Jesus Christ. They say, come. They are the voice of Jesus, which says, come, follow me. Jesus personified the word of God. As we were considering last Sunday, he is the word made flesh, the eternal logos that took our nature to himself. And we need to listen to him. That's what the Father says. Listen to this one. Listen to my son. We are to hear him and heed him. If we are to emulate and imitate Jesus, then we need to be familiar with the word and scripture, with the Bible. That's why we have the Bible read. That's why we have a Bible study. That's why I encourage folk to read the Bible. Read it daily. Let it saturate your mind and your heart that you would know God and know his will for your lives and for all our lives. You see, this is how we cultivate the mind and the heart of Jesus Christ. Jesus practiced the word. He practiced, in other words, what he preached. And again, there's an important lesson for us in his example. Because God's word elicits a response from us. We're not simply to be hearers of it, but we're to be doers of it. Both repentance and faith elicit are a journey. They call for action. Ours is a faith that works in love. Repentance is the about turn. It's a journey into God, to Godwardness, to Christ likeness, which is love. That's the journey. That's the new trajectory. And that's why that last song we sang, Will You Come and Follow Me? It was so appropriate to have the forward motion. We're on the narrow road with Jesus, looking to Him, trusting in Him. And that epitomizes our theme. That's what it's all about. And we need the map. This is our sat nav. This is our instruction manual. This is how we know God's will for our lives. Let all realize, therefore, their need for reconciliation and redemption. The time is fulfilled, says Jesus, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The new covenant age prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures is arriving. It's now here. The time is now fulfilled, says Jesus, through the coming of the Son of God, the Son of Man. The new age is dawning, and it will begin with the rising of the sun on the third day at Easter. And that's what Lent anticipates. 
building up to, looking forward to the new covenant age promised a new heart and a right spirit so that we can repent and believe. Hence, when Christ ascended after his ascension, what do we read but that he gave gifts to men, women, boys, and girls, to all. And the chief gift is the gift of the Spirit who anointed the church just as he anointed Jesus at his baptism. So he is poured out lavishly upon the church that we need not try and undertake this journey, this about turn and journey in our own strength, but by the grace of God, through his strength, his support, his succor. That's, what, that's why the Spirit is poured out upon the church, that we might hear and heed him. The new covenant age proclaims the lordship of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God, he says, is at hand. A kingdom specifically, expressly, requires what? A king. The clue is in the word. Jesus is that king. Jesus is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You see, that his cross had to proceed, but it nevertheless assured his crown. And hence he ascended for his coronation. All authority, he says, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore you go and share these glad tidings. Call people to repentance and faith. We've been working our way through the letter of Paul to the Romans. And this is what we, we read last week or the week before. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. You see, it's for all, everyone. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hence, we recognize the king. We enter his kingdom. We become citizens, but better than that, we become family. Our eldest brother is on the throne. We trust in his, his last will and testament, his last will and covenant with us. Let all therefore repent. Repent, he says. And believe in the gospel. That is, let all seek God's forgiveness. Let all recognize that we have sinned in thought and word and deed. Let us recognize that we are sick and we need healing. Let us recognize that we are bound and we are enslaved and we need to be liberated and rescued. Let all recognize that we are sinners and we need a savior. And there is no other name, we're told, given under all of heaven, whereby we must, notice the imperative, must be saved. That's what the scriptures teach. And you see, what is repentance? But that complete change of mind and heart that takes God at his word that stops and comes to one's senses and says, yes, Lord, you are right. And it's turning from that life which is heading away from God and turning around and turning back to God. That's what repentance is. It takes God at his word. Remember what John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Or collectively, think of the church. In trying and difficult days in the past, I used to work through presbytery records from the late 16th and early 17th century. And periodically you would discover the presbytery calling for national or 
uh, district, let's say, presbytery area, but it was national. Uh, days of what they termed humiliation and prayer. A day for calling upon the name of the Lord to come and revive his cause, seeking his forgiveness for failures, for the things done that we ought not to have done, the things that we have failed to do, and so on. And they have this biblical precedent for it. God says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. We sometimes think harsh thoughts of God. Who, who is God to tell me? But it's, he's the physician who in love is seeking our well-being, our welfare, who knows us better than we know ourselves because he made us in his image and likeness. And sometimes we need to hear and sometimes we don't want to hear. Don't know how many addicts you've met in your days, whatever it happens to be, and how many excuses one will make. No, no, I'm okay, I'm fine, and so on. Until they recognize, yes, in actual fact, I'm an addict. I need help. Well, this is what God is saying. Look, you need help. Come to me. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heavens and the earth. He will put it right. So it's an about turn. Let all forsake, he's saying, their son. It's that, eh, their sin. It's re repentance necessitates an about turn, a U-turn. It's the prodigal son coming to his senses amid the filth and the stench of the pigsty. He brought, he took himself into that place. His sins took him, brought him down to that level. And yet, once he comes to his sense and he starts making for home and he's so concerned, what's my father going to say? Will I be accepted? His father's already on his way to embrace him and his love, just like the word we saw last week. Let all live, you see. And this is the goal of it. And this is why repentance is so important. And yet, we hear very little about it because we are to live in love as a beloved family of God. And that's what it's a turning away from all the bitterness and the envy and the pettiness and all the stuff that spoils and stains our lives and embracing God's way of love, love for the Lord, love for one another. That's why the moral law is summarized, love God, love your neighbor. It's Christ likeness. It's following Jesus. That's what it is. That's what he's calling us to. A better way, a new way, the right way. That's the goal, you see, to live in harmony and wholeness with God and one another and his creation once again. It's a return to Eden, but even better. Let all therefore receive, let all rest, let us rejoice in the good news, repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus emphasizes the necessity of faith. You see, these two always go hand in glove. They always accompany one another. Repentance and faith. Because it's faith, it's the instrument that God uses. Like the video we saw, the forward motion. It roots us to and then it roots us in. The Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is conviction in him. It's confidence in him. It's commitment to God in Christ. Faith emphasizes, moreover, the necessity of fellowship. Hence, it's in the gospel. It's in Jesus Christ that we come to know the Father and receive the gift of the spirit of adoption and hence become his dear family members who can cry, Abba, Father. And that brings awesome privileges. But it also brings responsibilities and obligations. Something that we need to teach in our society once again, because everybody knows their rights, but no one knows their responsibilities. But that's the call. 
Jesus emphasizes hence the necessity of following him. Come, he says, and follow me. You all know the song. Follow, follow. We shall follow. It's Jesus. <laughs> or another song that I'm sure you learned in Sunday school or many years ago. I have decided, by God's grace, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. That's repentance and faith in a nutshell. And that's what Jesus was calling the people of Galilee to in his inaugural address. And that's what he's calling all people to today as well. Well, may he himself add his blessing to these few thoughts this morning. And he's going to lead us in prayer. <clears throat> Let us join together in prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for a world of wonder and mystery with so much to discover and so many ways of achieving that. We give you thanks for the variety of human life and for the gospel which has been taken to every part of the world. We give you thanks for everything good that has happened this past week, for people whose kindness is rarely reported, for prayers which have been answered, and for situations which have been resolved. We give you thanks for opportunities to praise and rejoice, for opportunities to learn and to grow, for opportunities to pause and reflect in our own time and space. We give you thanks for this Lenten season and for the one whose season it is. We give you thanks for all the things that make our life simple and special, good people and good things, good friends, and good food, good music, and welcome family. We give thanks for all who've walked before you in faith and hope and love, and especially for those whose paths have crossed ours. Above all, we thank you for Jesus Christ, who walks before you in trust and in truth, whose walk has inspired us and given us light, whose walk has taken him to death and beyond for our sakes. We reflect as a consequence on our journeys this week uh, and the journeys of others uh, and in this moment to collect our thoughts before God. We pray for those in leadership that they may act in the interests of those they represent, recognizing the benefits of peace and reconciliation to the nations for which they bear responsibility, realizing that war and retaliative actions achieve nothing other than pain and further suffering. We pray too the hungry might be fed in body, mind and spirit, that the thirsty be satisfied and that God will hear the cry of those who long for justice. We pray for those we meet each day at work or in the street, online or in person, at home or on our travels. We pray for those who teach in college and in school, in church and community, praying that knowledge may bring, build up humility, not arrogance and conceit, and that wisdom might guide the feet of all who walk our world. We pray for the ministers and elders of our church, especially in our presbytery and our parish, that they may serve with unity, with love and with joy. We pray for one another, that we grow up in faith during this period of Lent, that we renew our hope, that we open our hearts to the deep love of God. And all this, and in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We conclude with a, with a beautiful hymn or song, In Christ Alone.
in the church hall after the service let us conclude and now as we leave this place of worship the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be among you and remain with each one of you now and forevermore amen <laughs>